Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth lecture of the Understanding India series organized by Paraspar of Office of Communications, Indian Institute of Science. Uh, we are very happy to have Dr. Uddha Balakrishnan today, who would be speaking on how the government governance function in India. We all you know, all of us know how governments function, you know, from the outside perspective. But Uda bring being a you know uh, administrator himself knows how it functions from inside. So it's very good to have him here today. And I'll give you a brief, brief introduction of the speaker. Uh, besides being a very good friend, Dr. Uday Balakrishnan is a former member of the Indian Postal Service. He has worked in areas of logistics, finance inclusion, financial inclusion, banking, insurance, education, as well as women and unorganized labor and HRD. He uh, was in charge of the National Child Labor Elimination Program in the Government of India. Dr. Balakrishnan has been IS's longest serving registrar from, 2000, from the year 2000 to 2006 and retired as member of Postal Service Board, Government of India and Chairman of Postal Life Insurance Fund, which in his time was Rs 23,000 crore. Dr. Balakrishnan has conceptualized and held major national and international exhibitions, including a Gandhian village in the Open Society Archive, Budapest, and India on My Mind, uh, one of the country's largest cartographic exhibition at IAC Bangalore in 2018. Dr. Balakrishnan was the principal advisor of the 2014 edition of Kochi Biennale, India's premier art exhibition. So, Uday, we are very happy to have you here and you can begin. Uh, before that, may I request everyone to mute themselves and turn, uh, turn of their um, cameras uh, so that there's no disturbance during the uh, lecture and you can um, uh, regarding the questions we can take the questions at the end of the lecture you may type in your question in the chat box or raise your hand and i'll, I'll call out your name and after that you can ask a question uday you can begin yeah thank you so much vitasta it's very kind of you to have <clears throat> introduced me so generously and uh, I think un undeserving generosity sometimes because I've been overrated. I'm far retired from government now, 10 years and over. <clears throat> what uh, I'm trying to speak today is uh, on governance as such, because that is what I teach in the Indian Institute of Science to the undergraduate students. But uh, teaching is a wrong word. I actually facilitate an understanding of government uh, by the students who are members of my class. And that's the six semester UG students. Of course, first of all, let me thank uh, IAC for inviting me to give this talk on the webinar series, uh, Paraspar. To talk on governance is a very daunting task, but having worked in the government for over 35 years in several parts of the country, I mean, uh, literally from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, uh, I think I have a certain idea of what government is and how it works and why we should know a little more about how it works. So let me start with uh, this little talk because I'm going to keep it fairly short, not very long, so that there can be a lot of questions which I can respond to more easily. A little bit about the course. Why am I talking here? Why am I here? I'm here because uh, way back in 2013, Professor Gadakar of the Indian Institute of Science was in charge of the humanities program in the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, and I were discussing what can we do for the sixth semester students. At that time, there was no one in the horizon to do that program. And we discussed it and discussed it and finally I said, okay, let me give it a shot. And uh, I discussed it with a lot of my colleagues in the civil services. There were people in the Forest Service, in the IAS, in the income tax and others who came in, but mainly a, a very sharp person from the Indian Forest Service who retired as the Director General of Forest, Dr. Dilip Kumar. So we finally hit on the idea that what is this big misunderstanding in society? People don't know how government works adequately enough to uh, you know, make sense of it. Many of its actions look a bit insane, you know, I mean, very funny. And... Um, why are we uh, why are we putting up with this why can't they do better all these questions are being asked so we hit upon this idea that we should do a course not on introducing government but governance what does it mean to govern a country like this it's so big uh, that there's hardly anything left to compare ourselves with except china and all the countries that comment on us are also very very small they look at it from their own perspective and suddenly say oh this can be done it's very much like the six blind men of Hindustan who feel the tail and tell you that the elephant is like a rope 
feel the uh, ear and they say it's like a fan, they feel the body, it's something else. So it's everything to everybody. But it is something which intrudes into our life every day and every decision of government, most of it affects us in some way or the other. So we need to understand the system better, make use of it better because you and I pay for it. <laughs> now that I'm retired, I can speak a little more confidently. We pay for it. So, I mean, I'm also being paid my pension by all of you. So this, the USP of this course, and it, it's a very special course which we run and it's been running since 2014, that is from the first batch onwards, is to bring in very, very uh, high profile people, as high profile as possible, uh, who have been in policy making at the highest levels, who have, be, who have run elections, who have been election commissioners, who have been Supreme, Supreme Court judges, who have been union ministers in uh, key ministries uh, and, bring, and key academics also. Uh, Mr. Ramachandra Guha has spoken in this and he gave a wonderful talk the year before, last year in fact. So altogether governance is a huge topic and in which the students get a feel of people who actually uh, manage things in government. So this has been uh, an extraordinary thing for the students uh, for, the simple sen for the simple reason uh, that uh, they um, are also introduced to it in a big way uh, to people they would never otherwise meet. All these issues are impacting on all of us. Today, um, I am speaking to you with a great deal of sadness because I have lost about seven uh, very close friends of mine to COVID in Delhi and uh, elsewhere in North India. Now, this is truly tragic because they, uh, at least four of them died in their cars. They couldn't get to the hospital. And the cause for that is, of course, a lack of hospital beds, a lack of oxygen, uh, a lack of ambulances, and everything falls at the uh, door of the government. Why didn't the government act? I mean, that's one of the big things that's being asked. But let me assure you that uh, government, I mean, there are two aspects to it. One, of course, it's been a colossal failure and an underestimation of COVID-2, uh, uh, non-acceptance that it was going to be such a big thing at the highest levels. But the other level, there was a failure right across the board. You know, when you look at it, you're from the central level to the state levels, because health is a central and state subject. Nobody prepared for it, except one collector somewhere in Nadubari in uh, uh, Maharashtra, who sort of anticipated this and got it ready, and he has managed it extremely well. And the state of Kerala, of course, is, uh, uh, is a poster boy for managing uh, all sorts of disasters, from COVID to Zika to COVID and everything else. But yet, they've had a very bad COVID uh, second phase too. So then we come about looking at uh, governance uh, as an issue, that impacts on our daily life. Now, when we look at this, why are we uh, why are we um, talking of governance when our uh, systems are, are uh, being commented upon by a wide range of people who don't understand it enough? In fact, when I read the New York Times or when I read the Washington Post, I subscribe to both and foreign affairs as well. There are a small group of Indians who keep on writing in those things in those newspapers, that everything is bad, everything is rotten, everything is... It's not so. It's a huge country. And the only comparable country we have uh, to compare ourselves with is China. Uh, and there is no other country in the world which is comparable to us. 1.3 billion, 1.3 plus billion. That is how it goes. And uh, we are all uh, amazed at China's growth. I mean, I'm sure all of us are. And... Uh, this year, Xi Jinping could come around and tell us, that, well, he has eliminated poverty in his country. And what have we done? We have also eliminated a lot of poverty. Things have improved here, but not good enough because we have we host the largest number of poor in the world today. The numbers are so huge. We are, uh, and we are so uncompetitive that uh, it depresses us that this should be so. And... As I look at China, so this comparison with China is something which we need to look at very, very closely. And I'll just give, uh, I'm sure we all know the figures, facts and all that. So I thought, let me stick you with a few facts. This is taken from the Economic Times of 2018. And uh, yeah, it, it reads like this, India's GDP 2.2 trillion. 
China 14 trillion. Both have increased uh, uh, to some extent over the uh, years uh, since the statistics were developed, generated. Healthcare expenditure 29 trillion. China is 697 trillion. Now, perhaps that explains our COVID experience also. Education, India spends about 57 billion uh, US dollars all. China about 565. Uh, growth rate of researchers. Now, this many of you who are scientists here and who are in this uh, in this room uh, will appreciate the fact that the growth rate of researchers in India, according to this statistics, is 300,000. China has got one point, had 1.6 in uh, 2018, and China, you know, grows geometrically, and it would have had many more by now. The growth rate of researchers in India is 218 per million, China 1,176. Uh, patents, India has got about 45,000, China about 1.38, and it, both have increased since then. And money raised by startups is 13.5 billion, and China has raised 58 in 2018. Uh, unicorns, India has got nine, which is surprising, but we're very happy to know at least we have got nine. And uh, China has got about 71 of them. As the Hindus uh, correspondent Anand Krishnan tells us in his recent book, India's China Challenge, and that's a book I request all of you to read because this is one of the best books uh, on India-China relations uh, that I've come across. Uh, uh, and uh, it tells you as it is. It is not a it is not a government of India point of view, like a book I'm reviewing now. Uh, but it is very much a man who has lived in China and seen uh, it grow. Just a minute, please. I'm just getting the statistical portion right. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. So. As we as we progress, the, uh, we need to look at wh why is it that we are underperforming? 1978 is a very significant year when China uh, and the American Chinese partnership started getting closer. One of the reasons was they were trying to partner China to you know uh, turn it against Russia. They didn't have to because China was anyway not such a close friend of Russia's. But it also was an amazing partnership. Everything that China achieved was because of their partnership with the United States to a very large extent and to the West. They learned everything from there. They sent thousands and thousands of students there every year. In our case, we saw Ch we were on par with China in 78 in almost everything. Probably we were a little better in some areas too, but suddenly we collapsed. And where did we collapse? We collapsed because we had a lack of confidence. That is what uh, Kenneth Clark, a very famous art critic and uh, the producer of the very uh, well known, uh, one of the earliest documentary series uh, called Civilization on Western Civilization. He says, why did Western Civilization at a point of time in the, uh, in the early years, uh, in, um, in ancient times suddenly collapse? Greek, uh, Greece and Rome collapsed uh, with uh, dramatic results. And he attributes it to a lack of confidence. He attributes it to a lack of confidence, as he tells us in his book, Civilization. We may not tell so openly, but the fact is we are intimidated by the spectacular rise of China, and we seem to be going into a misplaced funk. We need to find, India needs to find confidence because our governance mechanisms are such, we need to find confidence uh, in ourselves. And if there is one big goal we need to give ourselves is to be as good or better than China in all the indicators that make people's lives better. I'm not saying that we necessarily have to beat them in space or in any other area which they are uh, famously involved in, but we need to give a better life to our people. We have a population, and India is not doing too badly. It has got uh, great possibilities as the world has noticed. That's why everybody, despite the dismal performance of our economy now, uh, 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 despite the performance of the economy at present, we are a big hope for the world because we are one unified country, we are a big economy, and we have millions of people more than any other. So the big goal we need to give ourselves is to beat China as a, a superpower in looking after our own people. We have a population. One of the big advantages India has is a huge demographic disadvantage. We have 
far more young people in India today than almost anywhere else in the world. Of course, Africa is growing fantastically. It's young is probably younger than ours. We have a population that will stay young for the next three decades, which is not bad. And for all its growth, China lives with its demons. Now, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story about this because I happened to be uh, in uh, Cambodia for a while as a UN consultant or rather a consultant to the International Labour Organization, which is one of the wings of the UN. And I met a lot of people across Cambodia because I had to, on this assignment, I had to travel. It decided immediately after I retired, took voluntary retirement from government and landed up in Cambodia. And I traveled the length and breadth of the company, spoke to a lot of people. One question I will never get an answer for is that what did your father do? Because they, they will never tell us. Because uh, anybody, uh, anybody's father would have been one of the uh, people who would have participated in a, ma in a massacre or would have been treated. Any survivor had survivor guilt because uh, a fifth of the population was executed, literally executed, by its uh, communist leader, Pol Pot, who wanted to take the country back to an agrarian communist society, which is a contradiction in terms. It looks very unmarxian to me. So, uh, and uh, China itself, um, in Eastern Europe, where I was a visiting fellow in a very good university there, now it has shifted from uh, Budapest to Vienna, is the Central European University. I used to run into a lot of communists, uh, former communists. Again, their role was always, I mean, in very, like in Cambodia, they said they were in the opposition. Anybody you spoke to who was over 50 will tell you he was in the opposition, that he was against Pol Pot, he took the gun, fought against them, all that he will tell you. And in very intricate detail, that it is incredible and unbelievable that he survived. <laughs> Similarly, in Eastern Europe, one encountered this extraordinary uh, situation where you would meet people who had left communist, who were communists, who would tell you how they were harassed and finished off by the communists, how, how their life was made miserable. Some of them were credible, some of them were true, but most of them were totally false. They were building up a false narrative of their past. We in India, you know, we are so lucky. We don't have to have a false narrative of past, most of us. We haven't had the kind of disasters that have overtaken China. Uh, and that is described in a very lovely, very uh, deeply moving book, not a lovely book, called uh, Tombstone. I don't know if you've heard of it. Mm, Tombstone is a book written by a man called, um, uh, let me see, Yang Jisheng. Now, Yang Jisheng watched in the late 50s, he watched his grandfather die of starvation. And like this grandfather, 40 million others died of starvation. So what did Yang do? He in the guise of being a journalist and writing a story, he went and checked up all the records that the government had maintained on deaths in different, different parts of the country. And he computed it with great difficulty and with great stealth and added, and the added number was 40 million people. So there isn't a Chinese alive today who would not have some link to a murky past his grandparents or his parents would have been involved in including their present leader, uh, Xi, Ping, uh, Xi Jinping, and uh, many others. Because it was a terrible time for them, and murder and rife and beating up uh, was routine. Uh, Anantakrishnan, that is the Hindu correspondent, has described it very beautifully in his book, India's China Challenge. He met many of these people who had been, uh, who had been persecuted and prosecuted and put in jail. As you know, uh, there is a huge difference between uh, a repressed society and an open society. So we have many good things going for us, but we are not conscious of that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so here we have to, we, we have to, uh, we have, we have to start feeling proud about our own country, not uh, be depressed about it because there are so many good things going about it. And we have a possibility that we can move forward and move ahead. We, we have the luxury of time which probably an aging population like China's doesn't. They're desperately scrambling to increase their population by giving a three China policy now from a one China policy. So I just want us to imagine a country, look where we were and where, where we are, where we, we place ourselves you now. Imagine a country splintered by faith, you know, we, uh, our, and it, it was uh, to become a secular republic. Can that happen? Has that happened anywhere? It hasn't. They've only become more fundamentalists. And here, even at a point of time when uh, there seems to be 
uh, a feeling that India is turning, uh, taking a right wing turn. There are enough here who are protesting and there are enough there who are listening and there is a discernible change. We cannot be too disappointed because popular democracy demands that you answer to the people also. And we are divided in so many ways, not just uh, by religion, but we are ethnically, north, south, east, west, so many by caste, so many, so many reasons why we stay divided. And one reason why we stay united because we are Indians and we have become truly a nation from being a country. And I would also like us to imagine in where in the world can we imagine uh, a constitution being drafted by a slave in the United States? Was that possible? Or a Roma? I mean, one of those uh, gypsies in Hungary who were persecuted. It didn't happen here. I mean, it, it, Ambedkar was the man who had the final say on many aspects of the constitution. So we are a fortunate country. It is not that uh, we are not uh, in, uh, uh, in a bad spot. We are in a sweet spot. The only thing is we have got the funk. India has got a huge funk. I'm coming to our bureaucracy. I want to talk of governance. What is happening? This is what is holding up governance. We need to draw uh, on, uh, on uh, and be inspired by what has happened in the past. I don't know whether you know when India became free in 1947, we were a broken country and a broke country. We didn't have money. We didn't have, uh, and we were broken in the sense that broken in spirit, people were divided. Even the states immediately after independence uh, and uh, a little later in the 50s, we were also uh, going undergoing an internal transformation where states were going linguistic uh, and uh, that had its own upheaval and uh, its own struggles, but nothing compared to what has happened elsewhere in the world. I mean, our, our struggles are very, very manageable and not that great. Uh, but we had a wonderful leader and whom we are quite forgetting now, we blame him for so many things, and that was Nehru. How did he manage? How did he manage in the 70s, a country so broken and, bro and broke at partition? In a mere 17 years, where did he find the imagination, the resources to achieve what he did with a bureaucracy which he inherited from colonial masters? Now, this is the same bureaucracy. This is the same bureaucracy which we are blaming for inaction, but what led to a position where the bureaucracy has descended into a situation where it is not uh, the wonderful thing it was once upon a time. <clears throat> now, uh, as things are, we, we are uh, all the things we are proud of today, whether it's the Atomic Energy Commission or whether it's the space, uh, whether it is space or uh, the space program or IITs or IAMs, anything. Those first 17 years, imagine a country which had no money, which had about 10. Uh, actual workable literacy of no more than 8%, they say 18%, but it's not factually correct. Um, and we were, and we didn't have money, and we didn't ever even grow our, enough food to feed ourselves. In a country like this in 17 years, what a stupendous achievement it was. No, nobody recognizes that today. But when you look back on it, and I'm about 70 now, uh, I'm past 70, and when I look back on the time, we had rations, it was difficult to get a telephone, it was... But still the country was growing. Amazing things were being done. The foundations for a modern Indian state were being laid by a remarkable man who had a vision. So India today is unfortunately from there, we, we, and finally under uh, by the time Indira Gandhi came, but again the foundations were laid in Nehru's time, um, uh, we achieved food security. We became a food surplus country eventually. Today we have a surfeit of food. In fact, so much so that uh, Nitin Gadkari, one of our Minister for Surplus Transport, is saying that, hey, listen, let us grow some of it and make it into biofuels. So, I mean, it's an amazing thing that uh, we have reached this point. Uh, there's a nice story about this, you know, when, um, I don't know how many of you have heard of General de Gaulle. General de Gaulle was the president of France, and, but before that he was a great general, and he is the father of armored warfare. What he did was he was invited to go to Stalingrad, where the Germans had advanced to the gates of Stalingrad and they laid siege to it. And finally, the Russians prevailed and all the German army under General von Paulus surrendered. But when it surrendered, so General de Gaulle was on top of one of the ramparts of uh, Stalingrad and he was looking around and he said, how wonderful, how wonderful, what a great people, what a great people. So the Russians naturally thought he was telling uh, uh, the Russians that they were a great people. So the Russians asked him, oh, we are a great people. Thank you very much. He said, no, 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 no. The Germans are a great people that they reached this far. So it's, it's, it's one of the ways. So in our case also, 
the, it's a miracle that we reached this far. Anything could have tripped us. You know, we 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 we, we were fighting a war immediately after we uh, became independent. We were fighting uh, hunger. We were, uh, we were staving off a famine. We were we were geopolitically we were being crushed between China and the, and uh, Russia. And internally, there was a lot of challenge for Nehru. It's not that he was a total dictator or anything, but he was a very strong and loved leader which gave him an enormous amount of strength. Probably you derive a greater strength in uh, being loved by the country, even if you're not by the parliamentarians who are supporting you. They understand, oh yeah, that's the person who's going to make us uh, get our seats back, uh, uh, get us back into the Lok Sabha again at the next election. But what unfortunately happened after the last big hurrah, I think, in my uh, uh, for us in terms of true big achievement was uh, a very small thing, but it's still, was an ambitious thing that we made a mission to Antarctica, and we still have a base there. And many of the people in the science, uh, it, 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 many of the uh, faculty members in IAC and elsewhere who are listening in would know, of course, that's a very impressive thing. At the time when we went there, people were wondering why the hell are we going to the Antarctica? But it has its uses now, we realize. But India today has become a very incremental country. It's a nation satisfied with small things. I don't know if you're aware that our GDP today is something which China had about uh, 10 years back or a, a little earlier than that. And at that time, they were already planning the moon, lunar, lunar missions. They were already planning their Mars missions. They were already planning their rovers in, Luna, in Mars and in, uh, in, in the moon, on, on the moon and on Mars. And they were planning so many other things and their biotech, uh, uh, bi biotech um, industry, uh, uh, sector was taking off in a big way. Everything about China it was exploding in a big way. One reason is they had uh, they had uh, they had a long term vision of things, and by the time they reached this point, we could send a probe, and we really prided ourselves. And I'm very proud of the fact that we went up to the moon and went around it, and almost attempted a rover, uh, a, a landing a rover there. And very proud that we did go around the moon. But in terms of actual, when you look, sit back and look. Is that is that all that this country should have achieved? We should be asking ourselves. But again, I'm not gaslighting on them. But the fact is, uh, the space mission is one of those which achieved a lot of its objectives because it had a long term vision. Even this achievement is significant by our standards, but by the standards of what China has achieved, it is not. Where we were together in 1978, we are not there together now. Mm. Uh, that is what uh, Yukon Huang, that is, uh, he wrote uh, very, uh, he is a Chinese American economist who served in China on the World Bank or IMF for many years and tra traveled the length of breadth of China. There is this huge myth that about China that it is, a, uh, it is a totalitarian state and it can achieve anything it wants. That's not so much. They have their diversity, they have their internal fights. It's not it's it's uh, it's not an easy place to run. No, no, no country which has got about 1.4 billion people. It's an easy place to run 1.3 in neither India nor uh, uh, China or for that matter. So. Uh, so here I come to what happened to this bureaucracy that performed under Nehru and then steadily went under. Why did it go under? Uh, when we look at bureaucracy, it's a vast system. It includes many, many players. Uh, first of all, the top levels of bureaucracy comprise many services. You have the uh, Indian uh, administrative service, you have the Indian uh, foreign service, you've got the Indian police service, and you've got a host of central services, One of to, to one of which I belong. I belong to the Indian Postal Service. At one time, it was a very important one. Perhaps it's not so important now, except for people who want to invest their money. These, bureaucrac these bureaucracies are huge and we are very good at keeping a system ticking along. But we need a bureaucracy which really performs, which can see big programs through. With every change in incumbent, unfortunately, in bureaucracy, the, the policies change, the way we do things change. That is because we don't have an overarching policy framework within which we say we are going to achieve these things within the next 10 years. We are going to achieve these things within the next 15 years, like China does. China wants to be a moderately developed country 2035. And look at the range of things they are working. If only it's too, this is, talk is too short for me to tell you about it. But 
it it has managed it quite well. I mean, so far after after its devastating time under Mao, it has really done well. Now, why is our bureaucracy so bad? That is the last phase of my conversation, which I want to bring to you. I have already spoken for about 35 minutes. I'll speak for another 10. One thing is the top bureaucracy operates in silos. It doesn't know. Uh, it really is not fully aware of what the other wing does. You take COVID today. Uh, COVID is uh, a pandemic which needs extraordinary human resources in uh, in management and control. It needs monitoring. It needs information gathering. It needs logistics to reach uh, medicines to places, etc. But when I ask my colleagues in the 75 batch forum, which includes all the civil services in the WhatsApp group. Uh, they didn't know what each of each other bureaucracies can do. So it ends up that the entire responsibility is shouldered by uh, the Indian Administrative Service, which really doesn't know how to access the services of the other services. For example, uh, the, the logistics, the information gathering, monitoring. You have a bureaucracy of more than two and a half million people at its core who can really contribute to this, but it hasn't been touched. So that's operating in silos. And on the converse side, I don't know why these uh, other services like the railways, the post and all did not go up and tell them, look, we, we are capable of doing, taking on these tasks to make your job easier. Now, this is a huge blind spot in bureaucracy. We, uh, when I joined service, we all the services were together. In fact, that is one of the things that should have been retained throughout one's career. That hasn't happened. We operate in silos. So in the end, we end up duplicating many, many things. Now I'll uh, give a small example. Uh, yeah, the, the, the example is that the railways were quite capable of producing PPTs at one stage. That is what two very senior railway officials told me who have managed big workshops and all. But they were not even asked at one stage. It's only when they were told that they can do it that they pushed up and made some. In effect, today the bureaucracy as such is uh, very much under what you call crisis management mode. It has to manage a crisis. It has to manage a. Uh, it has to manage a cyclone somewhere. It has to manage uh, a COVID uh, pandemic somewhere, and uh, the um, and some other some other big uh, disaster somewhere else. So, and it's in disasters that this bureaucracy really starts functioning. Also, that is when all rules are laid aside, and you can do as you please to get the situation under control. Why should it be like that? In effect, the bureaucracy that Nehru inherited inherited a scientific universe which was no different from that uh, that was available in the 1900s. But the but we have a bureaucracy which is 19th and 20th century today, which is quite out of depth with 21st century issues. And most of these issues are very scientific in nature: global warming, um, you know, uh, rising seas. Um, a huge, all the challenges that uh, environmental pollution, all these things are very science based. This bureaucracy is not tuned to handle that. Uh, so uh, the reform bureaucracy should have the human and then the reform, the bureaucracy as such is a very arrogant creature. It doesn't matter which section. It's not only the IAS, it's the Indian Postal Service as well. It's, uh, it's the Indian railway traffic. It's a very arrogant uh, behind the chair. I am king attitude. So that has to give way. It has to hum it has to have developed humility to talk to those outside its world, such as leading NGOs with proven records, such as authorities. It should not say that, oh yeah, let me call Raghuram Rajan and ask him, what are we going to do with the economy? Give him the authority, respect him, call him, don't call him names. And give him the po give such positions as the, as the Reserve Bank of India to people who know how to run them, not to serving bureaucrats. And the reform bureaucracy should have uh, should not imagine that it has a solution for every problem. The, the problem is that the bureaucracy feels that it has a solution for every problem. Now, uh, I'll come back to Yukon Huan in his book, Cracking the China Conundrum. The Chinese American economist Yukon Huang, he was, he's a very famous economist. You, you should listen to some of his podcasts, had highlighted an area where we seem to be constantly stumbling. The difficult art of moving ideas to fruition. So this is what he had to say, and I'm reading from my tablet. 
both Deng Xiaoping and Zhu Rongi, who later became the prime minister, who was the vice prime minister of uh, China and later became prime minister, exemplify what some scholars have called policy entrepreneurs. Through their ideas and actions, they were able to overcome their ideas. Uh, they were able to overcome their ideas and actions. They were able to overcome vested interests, in this case, the Communist Party and bureaucracy. You want, when you, when you read about China on the surface, and I'm reading about it very deeply these days, uh, China is not what it appears, a command economy all the way. It is a very totalitarian system. It is now uh, a very fascist kind of leadership is there. But nevertheless, it has its ears on the ground. Uh, it might be the most surve a surveillance society in the world, but it has its ears to the ground. It listens to the people far more than our people do. And the top echelons of Chinese bureaucracy are brilliant people. Uh, I mean, they know what they're doing. Of course, they make horrendous mistakes. Right now, they acknowledge that the Three Gorges Dam, the biggest in the world, I think, is a huge mistake after it was. And uh, some years ago, they completely, yeah. Uh, and they completely uh, uh, hid the fact that a big dam collapse had taken place and uh, more than uh, near more than 100,000 people had died. So the, the, they are capable of both. Uh, it, it is what you call a, uh, in a way, it's a vast prison. In a way, it, it has freed the people to enjoy their lives as they wish. Um, now, a successful change, uh, as they say, in this case, the Communist Party and bureaucracy, successful change is about finding ways to alter incentives and transform institutions to realize a dramatic improvement in living standards. More than anything else, this is what our leadership needs to learn. The biggest thing a pro, uh, top bureaucracy has to overcome, if it has to succeed and it has to do its job well in the century, is uh, to stop neglecting its lower formations. I'm speaking some very, very basic things. I hope you'll excuse me for doing this. Our investment, the investment uh, in training top bureaucrats is so much more than training the rank and file of bureaucracy right down to the clerical level. So what happens? You get lousier clerks in post offices and um, uh, railway stations. You don't get them in, in, uh, in colleges, uh, in, oh my God, yeah. Uh, you don't you, you, you inadequate opportunities for the smarter ones to rise. So there is a general if you go to any office, the morale there is generally very low most of the time. Th that is because uh, the top bureaucracy neglects it. Three weeks training, two weeks training. They don't invest enough in training them in enough. While a lot depends on the uh, an inadequate direct exposure to do uh, to those they deal with. Imagine if Ministry of Education uh, uh, staff at levels lower, the uh, section officer and lower, were continuously made to visit the different scientific institutions in the country and develop an, and and these scientific institutions made an effort to reach out to them. I can assure you things will be moving up the ladder much faster than they are right now. Yeah. Neither are the scientific institutions, uh, neither are our research and scientific and uh, higher education institutions inviting them. Nor, are, nor is the government sending them. So it's a, it's a dialogue of the deaf. So when a file comes to them, it's only a piece of paper. They'll, they will uh, take care of it as a piece of paper. They'll see it on the merits of the case. That's a very big phrase in bureaucracy. Okay, the merits of the case or this demands. So it's far George Fernandez had a solution to that. He sent all these people to Siachen and told them, you go watch there. Don't keep rejecting proposals when I ask you for snowshoes and other things <laughs> by sitting in your table and saying no. <clears throat> go and see the ground realities and then make up your mind. Now, that is one of those things. So and uh, while a lot depends on the political, now people, the, the common excuse, which I find in my uh, circles, uh, in my bureaucratic circles, which cuts across services, is, uh, while a lot depends on political masters, there are there are still vast areas within bureaucracy which are in bureaucrats' hands. Now, the common refrain is, oh, what if Modi doesn't love me? If what if uh, Sonia Gandhi doesn't allow me? What if some at every stage it's very easy to pass the work and say, but what are the what are the things you're capable of? You're capable definitely you're capable of improving the training of your subordinate formations. There's no Nobody's going to question you on that in government. Nobody's going to tell uh, uh, turn down uh, this opportunity. Uh, uh, if a bureaucrat were to take it to the top and say, look, I want my section officers to spend a week 
at least in this IIT or this IASC and uh, learn from them and a good interaction Sunny. Nobody's going to stop them from that. People can find the money, and, uh, which also brings me to the fact that we continue to believe that we are a resource poor country. We are not a resource poor country. We spend our money very stupidly. Uh, for a system that and and the worst thing about bureaucracy is there has to be an evaluation of these bureaucracy of the of, of the top officials by a system in which those they serve actually evaluate them also today the bureaucracy evaluates itself and awards itself top marks for doing doing a lousy job I'm, I'm being very blunt in this conversation I've also been a top bureaucrat so I'm blaming myself for that also for a system that's allow, allowed to um, evaluate and transform itself, Indian bureaucracy is sitting in the dumps and reveling in its apparent helplessness. That is what I've written. Now, when we look at uh, bureaucracy, so when we look at this COVID crisis, what really went wrong that we couldn't assess it? We knew a second wave was coming. We knew that uh, we needed this. Uh, we needed all these things to, uh, you know, uh, survive it and minimize the damage, but we didn't do anything and we were sitting tight. Today, the only uh, I would blame the central government was at the helm of matters. It has to undoubtedly be blamed. But what were the state governments doing? Finally, it landed on one collector alone in um, more than 600 to do something about it and pre-plan his actions to be ready for it. So it tells a lot about bureaucracy. Now, when it comes to defense also, you just take this in. During the Kargil war, one of the things which went unnoticed was the fact that we were scrambling for shells for our Bofors guns, which were extremely effective against the uh, Pakistanis who were mm, up in the mountains. But we were almost getting shells from the factories overseas into uh, flying them into the battlefield. Recently, we had this crisis with uh, China. What were we doing there? We ordered a huge amount of uh, uh, you know, warm uh, equipment to keep our soldiers warm there. Why now? You know you're going to be in Ladakh. You're going to be fighting there. Why now? So we have, we have a lot to answer on these things. And we are not questioning enough. Similarly, I, I'm coming back to ISRO. I'm not against ISRO. I'm very proud of this organization. But the fact is, after a failure, I haven't seen, uh, unless I missed it, I haven't seen a single article which questions what went wrong with the uh, rover not getting onto the moon and doing its job. There is no public inquiry. Now, when uh, when uh, Feynman was asked to inquire in, uh, into the disaster of the Apollo, uh, 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 was it the Apollo mission? I think it was. He, it was an O-ring that went wrong, and he and they corrected themselves. But where is there a public debate on things that go wrong? Why? why I haven't seen a single newspaper article talk or uh, in the news saying why are we buying cold equipment for cold weather right now when I, we are fixing the roof when it is raining, which is a stupid idea. So I uh, come into this, the bureaucracies are also not capable of acknowledging their mistakes. So on the whole, I think we have a wonderful, brilliant individual bureaucrats, but collectively we are not able to mesh together for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, it is not the politician who is doing this, but it is the bureaucrats themselves who are doing themselves in. Now, when we look at the, all these things, uh, I have uh, uh, I have referred to uh, the uh, Yu Yukon Huan's book, in which he asks uh, that uh, the actors, you know, that is, um, we should be uh, th through their ideas and actions, they were able to overcome their ideas. He said, policy become policy entrepreneurs. I think it is important we should become, uh, we should, uh, bureaucrats should become policy entrepreneurs for their, uh, for their uh, uh, political masters. And the society as a whole should bring its expertise to tell bureaucracy what can be done. I am sure they will also listen. I think there has to be a change in the mindset at all levels. Now, the last point I'm making, and I'll stop here and take questions. Let's look at our own scientific institutions. I had this lovely article with Professor Gadakar of uh, a former president of INSA sent me, in which he's, he in which he exhorts the scientific community to make policy documents, share it with people, so that there is uh, a policy advice going to government, which is not going now. Uh, these are things within society we should be managing if we have to really progress. We have the opportunity. Today, we are far wealthier than before. 
and we are uh, really, really lucky that we are in this sweet spot. But we may not be China, but we are certainly doing rather well. So I just want to leave you with this very hopeful quote from uh, from uh, I want to leave leave this very hopeful quote from uh, V.S. Naipaul, in which he says, "I'll just get it right. One minute, just hold on, please." Yeah. Uh, so he's, he talks of uh, a, a, B.S. Naipaul wrote a very, very bad book on India, which was very critical of India. Uh, but later he uh, came back to India and uh, wrote a book which showed India in a better light. It's called uh, India, A Million Mutinies Now. And I think I'd recommend that many of you should get your hands on it if you've already not got your hands on it. It reads like this. Many thousands of people have worked without any sense. Uh, this is what he says. He says many thousands of people have worked hard to make India uh, without any personal drama. Many millions have added up to the 40 years since independence to an immense national effort. The result of that effort were no, now noticeable. What looked suddenly, uh, what looked sudden had long been prepared. The increase in wealth and shows uh, in the new confidence of the people now. Now, when he says that, what Nepal is saying is this is written 40 years, uh, 40 years after independence. It's an extraordinary country which has just he's just seeing it rising. He didn't live to see this day. But the fact is, India was built in the first 17 years by quiet, silent workers under a very inspiring leader. I think inspiration, leadership and bureaucracy responding to them uh, has been what uh, has made the India that is there today possible. I think to carry the next step onward is not to look into the past, but to say, yes, we have done it once. We can do it again. So thank you very much. Thank you, Uday. Uh, we will now, now take some questions. Uh, people who want to ask a question can type in the question in the chat box or they can raise a hand and I'll call out the names. Then they can unmute themselves and ask the question. Okay, Dr. B.J. Shiva Prasad, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving an opportunity for me to ask the question. Uh, it was an excellent uh, talk by Professor uh, uh, Uday Balakrishnan. And I learned a lot about uh, governance and administration in India. And uh, it was very good that you uh, actually interconnected the boundary between uh, governance, uh, uh, humanity, and uh, so many other uh, uh, aspects of uh, uh, governing a big country to science also, to science. And uh, say, I don't want to take too much time. And uh, some of the things uh, which you touched on upon, uh, including bureaucracy, yeah, I, it was very interesting to me, and of course we have uh, at the end, uh, close to the end, you touched upon ISRO, not actually disclosing uh, Chandrayaan 2's uh, uh, investigation, and perhaps not kind of allowing public to know about it. And in fact, I have another uh, issue similar to that, uh, uh, as far as, and you also mentioned, India uh, has lack of confidence, lack of confidence, by the government, and that is why we are intimidated by the spectacular. We were India was intimidated by the spectacular rise of China, um, and that is why you see India did not uh, uh, actually overtake China as far as uh, economics and various other aspects are concerned. But in my, in fact, would you agree that uh, I will raise the issue of Kaveri engine as an aerospace engineer? Kaveri engine. In fact, I have talked with many of the experts here and professors and experts because I have. I'm, uh, I mean, born in India, and although I'm a U.S. citizen, I'm born in India, and uh, I was always uh, thinking why India could not develop one engine when they have uh, spent uh, nearly 50 years or uh, something, or uh, why one engine could not be completed. And what you said is right. The lack of confidence can be applied to that. See, if for uh, developing any new thing, someone has to test it. See, uh, they have designed, India is very good talent very good talent of engineers in India, and they can develop uh, and make wonders. But unfortunately, they should have the confidence to test it. See, let them fail. I mean, the government will definitely, in fact, the Honorable Prime Minister now, even though there is a failure, unfortunately, it was a failure. And uh, although, of course, ISRO did not agree with it, I'm, uh, uh, it was not a success, because uh, the uh, final aim of the mission, important aim of the mission was not achieved. And uh, but the uh, honorable prime minister of India, he encouraged them so well. So when the government can encourage, I think uh, uh, 
of course we should not the technologists who are very well uh, who have very good talents they should not uh, actually lose confidence and uh, uh, in fact they should test it so that is the reason why i think i uh, have cavery engine has not been developed so uh, i mean otherwise uh, how is it other countries have developed and uh, these are all the developed technologies and uh, that is one issue uh, one important issue if you have any comments about that i would appreciate um actually nor has china been able to develop a very good engine for its stealth aircraft they are still dependent on russia for that so uh, uh, but yes they will get there eventually they will get there and uh, they are uh, russia has become a junior partner to china in many areas now but uh, our lack of confidence i can tell you is because we somehow were given up saying that we can beat china we can we can we can, we can achieve when i say beat china it is not a competition of going to space or becoming a greater military power i'm talking of improving the quality of average uh, life of the average indian making it much better what the chinese have done and anand krishnan in his book india's china challenge he brings it through numerous examples that the average life of the chinese is much better he is a much freer person where he is than indians are now this is something which i have heard from a number of people it's not uh, people who are against china also there uh, who say yes when you go to china everything works I and mean, there's no problem i can check in i can do things i don't get uh, i mean it is something which they have of course we are culturally very different we are a little more anarchic we are little more free we uh, haven't gone through the traumas that china has gone through but all the same this lack of confidence is a recent thing it wasn't there in the 50s we were we were so badly off in the 50s no food no money foreign exchange i remember going abroad when a little later right up to the 1980s when the my, when i undertook my first foreign trip as a government officer i got about 20 dollars in my pocket and uh, 300 dollars because i was in i, I was uh, a part of a delegation and i had to entertain people so this is this is the way we operated today where is that for it and it was stamped on the back of my passport and when i returned i think i had to surrender that money also things have changed dramatically india should really be a much more confident country on what it has achieved in the past that's all i can say uh, professor shiv prasad uh, i definitely agree with you uh, professor uday balakrishnan uh, because uh, india i mean confidence actually leads to achieving things and uh, what what you say is uh, correct and i definitely agree with you and of course i i would like to ask uh, another question about the uh, uh, can, uh, can i, I could yeah I, could i take can a few take... words here yes. uh, before i go to come to you because there are several yeah. hands raised here okay okay yeah uh, yeah thank you thank you very much uh, for yeah, answering thank you. i'm sorry yeah. but i'll yeah. i'll be very happy to answer your question but tell yeah. me just yeah. could you say who is the next yeah can uh, can jayawardhan shivam uh, please uh, unmute himself and ask the question yeah uh, uh, thank you sir uh, my question is uh, like you mentioned that we inherited a bureaucracy so is there a fundamental difference between the bureaucracy which we inherited and what it has become now because there seems seems to be a public notion that it has become too subservient to the political masters is it really so and if so then what can be done uh, you see it's a yeah it's a very pointed question and i'll answer that uh, very shortly uh, you see the bureaucracy uh, cries even before it is hit yeah, and and i am one of them so i can i am an insider uh, i don't think uh, this political entrepreneurship you know this capacity to influence a politician is a skill that a bureaucrat should, a bureaucrat should have i don't know how many of you have seen that uh, that series yes prime minister it is a classic case where the minister and the political masters are being guided by the bureaucrats rather than them forcing the bureaucrats to do their things here why are we falling so fast there is a i mean you are equipped you are trained to communicate an idea to people you are trained to put a point of view across but that boils down to one important deficiency in bureaucracy every bureaucrat is looking for i mean not every most bureaucrats are looking for something better after their retirement so this uh, relationship is very uh, very uh, it's a very transactional between what i'm going to get therefore i keep my mouth shut many many people who can open their mouths and will not be wrapped on their knuckles keep quiet for these reasons 
I'm being very blunt. I may be wrong, but anyway, there you are. That's my answer to you. Thank you, sir. I guess your point that uh, that uh, art of uh, convincing your master should be learned and processed. I think that's what I was. I wanted to understand. Thank you, sir. But they know it. The fact is, they know how to convince. But uh, all of us know. Uh, it it is not as if there will be hard nuts to crack in uh, in the political circle. Definitely, very arrogant uh, ministers. But even they can be dealt with. But anyway, uh, but uh, has it changed from the beginning, from 1950s to now? I, it's a very tricky question. I think the bureaucracy has to deal with a lot more and lot more complex problems, but it hasn't changed enough to be capable of handling those problems in the way they should be handled. That's why I said. 19th and 20th century bureaucracy for a, for 20th and 21st century problems is a no no. We need to radically change the way we uh, our bureaucracy works. Yeah. Next question. Uh -huh. Yeah, there Thank is you. a question. Uh, there is a question in the chat box uh, by Rahul Patil. Uh, we see a lot a lot about data analytics these days. Can you please put some light on adoption uh, of data analytics in different government department? Uh, there is another question. Shall I read out or? Yeah, read it. Uh, I'm not able to see it. It's in the yeah, chat box. Uh, okay, yeah. I see it. Second uh, question is connected. Uh, okay, you may. Uh, would you like to answer the first question? Yeah, I will. We see a lot about data analytics these days. Can you please put some light on adoption of data analytics in different government departments? Yeah, actually, government departments. Uh, Data analytics is fine, but where is the capacity to process and make sense of them and convert them into policy initiatives? It is it is not there. Our bureaucracy is not a long term. It doesn't think long term. It thinks for the for the length of term of its uh, of its top bureaucrat. So what happens is this data analytics are, are tweaked to quickly give a solution which will immediately get him a kudo, some uh, good results immediately, but not over the long term. One of the Things I noticed is, you know, we also tend, uh, bureaucrats also have this grand opportunity to tweak bureaucracy as they please in whatever position they have been. And it has happened to me also. But that's not good. They're, they're, we have to operate within a system, not operate outside the system. So I think this analytics part is very necessary. Without analytics, how can we make any progress? But the fact is, bureaucracy is inadequately equipped to make a use of the, uh, the of the extraordinary amount of information that is flowing its way. Uh, and that, yeah. that brings me to the point that where we have neglected the lower. OK, now uh, I, was, I am looking, uh, I'm, I'm watching a series called Family Man. And it is so true to life as described by my late friend Radha Vinod Raju, uh, who was a police officer and founder of the National Investigation Agency. I mean, it's the, the amount of tension, the amount of uh, work they put into it is extraordinary. But that's analysis, continuous analysis to see that we are safe. And today, by the way, as an aside, let me tell you, the police, we owe a lot to the service to keep us safe and uh, where we are, wherever we are. I mean, it has its bad side, but nevertheless, it's uh, it's more sinned against than sinning. But to specifically answer your question, we are ill-equipped to handle the extraordinary amount of data that is coming our way, bureaucracy. There's a second question. Uh, what different, what sort of different sorts of technologies, technologies do you think can improve the government functionalities? Um, you see, the bureaucracy has got brilliant people right up and down the line because it recruits uh, some of the best people in uh, society. I mean, they, they usually, for example, you just take a department like the Postal Service or anything else. It recruits people on the basis of marks, good marks. They have done well in school, so you expect them to do reasonably well elsewhere. But you got to train these people. In technologies, there are. I have seen people do extraordinary work on technologies in our department, where we have millions and millions of accounts. In in fact, about 300 million accounts are managed. Postal accounts managing more than uh, how much? More than uh, uh, 500,000 crores or something of money. Uh, and these are being managed by uh, people who have been trained and equipped for that. But not everyone does it. The railways does it uh, beautifully in its. Uh, in, in its reservation and ticketing systems. And there are people at levels who can manage it, but there are not enough. We are not training them enough. We are not making their lives comfortable. We are not even making their work environment good. So this is how, uh, I mean, I, I call ours a very predatory bureaucracy, which looks after itself rather than it, the people working for it. 
So I think it, within bureaucracy, you can find enough to do this type of data analytics and uh, um, assimilate uh, technologies, but we aren't doing enough to uh, bring them up to board and not rewarding them enough and making their lives a lot more comfortable within the system. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I is, see a raised hand DP or somebody, is it? Uh, it's this, uh, Dr. BG uh, Shiva Prasad. Okay. Then let uh, us there's, see. There's, an, there's another question. Shall I read out? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a longish question no. by Rohit. Yeah. I'm not working with facts here, but I would assume people in China all speak in Mandarin, perhaps in different dialects. How big of a challenge would you say is the language in different states being different a challenge to governance at various level, levels? There's another question. Would you, yeah, you can answer that and we'll take the next one. Okay, and the other one is I don't actively watch speeches by leaders, but it is my very narrow assessment that if it will be entertained, it will be entertained that leaders don't dabble in numbers or uh, headline politics. Okay, we'll, uh, let me answer the first question. I'm not working with facts here, but I would assume people in China all speak in Mandarin, perhaps in different dialects. How big uh, a challenge would you say is the language in different uh, states in India? Actually, it's interesting because I worked in the north also, in Bihar and uh, uh, Delhi and in uh, Kashmir and other places. But in Bihar and all, all work had to be done in Hindi and they were pretty smart all, all, and they worked well. I mean, they, they use the language that they know best, their own mother tongue. The problem arises in the South, where I also worked in many parts, from Andhra Pradesh to Karnataka to Kerala. And I've seen one problem. Uh, as when I started my career, the knowledge of English was pretty good. So all the manuals for the South Indian, four South Indian states for any department is in English. But uh, their ability to assimilate and make sense of this is very, very uh, is circumscribed. It's coming down. So perhaps uh, we need to either improve their knowledge of English or equip them to work in the mother tongue within their own states. That's I'm talking of central government establishments. But certainly there is nothing wrong in improving the English also because these manuals are extremely clear and simple. They are not very complex, but yet systems continue to be operated and they are challenged by language sometimes. Yes, I can say sometimes, not all the time. Does that answer your question? Or do you want to ask something more? Then I'll go to the next one. I don't actively watch speeches by leaders, but it's my dabble in numbers or headlines. They resort to slander and other accusations other than facts and politics. What is your thought using better media practices, transparency, disseminating? I think, you know, we are, a, uh, uh, we make our people infantile. Uh, see, the, our problem is, uh, you know, leaders and government quickly tend to pile on to people and tell them what to do. This is sedition. This is, uh, this is hate speech. I'll take you to court. I'll fix you there. A democracy doesn't work that way. A democracy has to be a lot more open. A democracy has to be a lot more critical. And uh, by and large, uh, people uh, in politics, I mean, uh, don't be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, don't be there if you don't, if you can't handle the situation. The, the, the politicians are taking refuge by silencing a vast, they think after five years, Ramachandra Goa famously said that uh, we are an election only democracy. So after an election, everybody thinks he's the dictator for the next five years. He doesn't think he actually is a dictator for the next five years. So uh, we come into a situation where uh, the bureaucracy, the political leadership have become extremely sensitive and angry about criticism. They don't take it kindly. And I think this is one of the big deficiencies uh, and uh, puts us on the road to a totalitarian state someday. In fact, as it is, the evidence is there. Somebody criticizes you three will go to jail. But this is not happening only under this government. It has happened under the previous governments also. In fact, the first person, I, I'm a great admirer of Nehru, but the first thing he did in 1950 50, was to introduce a bill to curb the freedom of speech and limit it. Can you believe he did that? He did that. And, he's, he, and he is a great Democrat. But of course, as I say, to run a great country, a big country, there are some things which you need to do. Uh, it cannot be a free for all. India can, if China had listened to everything that the West told it to do, it would not have developed this much. In fact, my personal view, 
is that Tianmen Square was even a necessary thing for them to put down if they if, to get out of the hole they were in at that point of time. So if we don't have to accept Western standards of uh, freedom and democracy, but at the same time we need to value freedom and democracy for our own sake. Yeah. And this, uh, the politicians will be uh, hurling abuses at each other. Look at what's happening in the US, but the US has still to be overtaken by China. So a free for all, a society which argues and fights is not necessarily a bad society. It's a society which really is thinking, is acting, it's uh, challenging. So to that extent, we are lucky. The next question is by Anurag Panda. Can public movements demand bureaucratic reform? Will that be effective? If so, what do you think two, three specific demands by them can be? Uh, uh, Andra, can you uh, tell me what public movements you mean? Sorry, uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you're audible, perfect. Um, so uh, I guess there's the farmers movement, there was RTI movement, and then uh, there's other, I guess, um, yeah, collective citizens coming together and demanding something. Yeah. I, I get the point. Uh, you see, uh, the RTI, you know, the uh, information commissioners, you know, they, they are the ones who determine whether which RTI will go through and which will not, uh, in the sense that if you if you challenge them finally. But they all, most, almost all of them happen to be bureaucrats. So I, I wouldn't fault with that either, because in, in government, uh, you need to be very careful as to what, so, what is being sought by the public and what you need to disclose. In a society like ours, some critical information, could lead up to a riot, could lead up to uh, situations which become uncontrollable. So I suppose uh, a certain amount of control on what uh, government discloses in any government is required. Um, otherwise, it will be highly embarrassing and we'll be working ourselves to a frenzy, uh, literally to the ground by trying to respond. But at the same time, I think uh, these systems like RTA and all also need a, a very sober public uh, a person from outside bureaucracy to be sitting there also to challenge the point of view within the body to say what can be disclosed and what cannot be disclosed. I think that sort of a system is there, but it's only in name. So I think we need to make it in fact, and there has to be a public movement to reform it. Yeah. And then will that be effective? Yeah. Well, the RTA is a great advance, but it is not sufficient now in the sense that uh, the way it's operating, because more and more information is being withheld, and uh, the information commissioners are agreeing that it can be withheld. So, sorry, sir, but, if you don't mind, uh, do can I just clarify my question? Just one more. Um, sure. I, I guess the the way I see it is that um, you know, like now, there's a lot of movements around caste and you know, farmers like uh, professions, but something like bureaucratic reform should have um, acceptance maybe across the public, right? Because everybody suffers from having to deal with uh, bureaucrats who don't uh, effectively deliver public services. So I guess I'm imagining something like if there is a public demand for reforming the bureaucracy, would that be something that would like, I don't know, the politically be palpable? And then what would be two or three specific things they can demand that you think would bring about reform if you think that is something that is politically? Uh, I have. I'm a bit of an extremist, and my colleagues in bureaucracy may find my uh, my views a little odd. But I think there there should be a, any bureaucrat who deals with the public directly. I mean, uh, should have a public evaluation to his own performance added to it, uh, and that has to be devised quite a bit uh, intelligently because I think that is where the rub is. Uh, the moment you're going to be evaluated by somebody, then you're going to be careful with that guy. So right now, but on the converse side, I also find within bureaucracy a great effort in many public service departments to meet uh, public grievances with empathy. So it's not that bureaucrats are anti-public. It is just that it is impossible in the system that we uh, bureaucracy has ring-fenced ring itself to be very open about whatever it does. Uh, I don't think bureaucrats are bad. I mean, much as I have said uh, many things about bureaucracy, I don't think bureaucracy is a lousy system. It has kept us together. It has uh, run the systems. Today, you know, I have lived in African countries which have had coups where you, uh, after for 10 days, 12 days, you wouldn't know where to turn to. But India still has a fairly good system. In 600 and odd districts, there are collectors to, who, who take charge of situations. It's like a, 
it's very much like a ship which has got many compartments. So it's almost unthinkable. In an India like this, after Rajiv Gandhi's death, I was in Hyderabad and things were absolutely chaotic for a few days. But then the civil administration took over and brought it together. So I greatly admire the people who brought this together. But, but all the same, uh, bureaucrats can be very cagey people precisely because they can get themselves into deep trouble if they are too open. Thank you. Yeah. Is there any last question? Yes, Shiv Prasad, tell me. Okay, thanks for permitting me to ask another question, particularly regarding bureaucracy, which you have uh, explained to us very well. Uh, bureaucracy, uh, in my view, essentially involves uh, too many steps and too many signatures, of course, which delays the execution of any project. So what you said is right, that for the, uh, the present century, for the present century, a radical change is required to change the system. And uh, my question is, so can we use uh, the artificial intelligence uh, and even machine learning or whatever the latest technology to develop, uh, I mean, uh, management and uh, appropriate management and administration software to automate the steps, even including, of course, uh, adding the, putting the signature also, and for communication. Uh, can that be yeah. used? And is it being effectively used in India? I'm sure there are a lot of softwares developed uh, for the administration management. And uh, uh, has it been? Yeah. I actually, Shiv, I am a little out of my depth in uh, artificial intelligence, so I can't really say that. But um, uh, AI and uh, uh, surveillance techniques that have developed in China has made the entire country a sort of a prison in a sense that their even their behavior is going to be reflected in the driving license they get or uh, the bank accounts they can open. I mean, it's a terrible system. It's a, in a way, it's a, it's a very dangerous system. We need to, I don't know. I mean, actually, I can't answer this question very easily because I, I know so little about artificial intelligence. But to the extent I know it, it is being used devastatingly by totalitarian systems. No, but Professor Uday Bal Balakrishnan, I mean, I agree with you, but there in China or any other place, artificial intelligence and our technology can be misused. So that is what you were referring to, in my view, is a misuse of technology. But at the same time, this is just to reduce the number of steps, including communication, time involved, time and number of steps. Yeah, so, yeah Dr. Shivprasad, actually a lot of uh, things have eased in government today. I don't have to do, uh, I don't have to go to uh, any system to pay my electricity bill, to pay my water bill, to so many things I practically do. I don't meet a bureaucrat for many of the things I, I needed to meet earlier. So things have improved in India. I'm being hypercritical because we need to reform this for ourselves, not to be critical of bureaucracy, you know, as they say, and the old order change the yielding place to new. Uh, God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom corrupt this world. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand that whatever worked earlier is no longer, uh, has to be improved and tweaked now. We need a different system. And we need a more accountable system because uh, we have inherited a colonial bureaucracy which has at the back a colonial mindset of not being very, very open about what it does. So anyway, I must say I can't answer. Thanks a lot. Uh, 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 yeah. There's a there's a last question that we'll take. It's in the chat box. I'll just read it out to you. Uh, okay. This is by Subhashish Ganguly. Can there be some improvement in recruitment process that can address the various lacunae in the system? I I I think you know in bureaucracy there are uh, I'll, I'm treading a very delicate area here, but uh, in the system uh, in the way we are recruiting people, yes. We uh, we used to be very critical of bureaucracy, saying that they are they are forced to uh, write notes and they are forced to pressy things. They are forced to you know uh, in their notes and all. But when I initially joined service, I'm just giving an answer to your question. When I initially joined service, that was the strength of bureaucracy that a clerk could put up a reasonably well argued note referring to everything that had happened before and the point of view which is being discussed. He'll put it up to you nicely. But the government of India also changed its recruitment system for the lower formations of bureaucracy. They made it uh, what you call question answer type questions where they could get in. Finally, when I landed up in uh, government again and again from 1982, it, from 1980 onwards, I've been uh, posted in Delhi on and off. So whenever I landed there, I found a deterioration in the quality of output of uh, people at the lower formations who are putting up things because they could not express themselves clearly, whether in Hindi or in English. 
it didn't matter because they can't they couldn't read a thing properly summarize it properly link it to what was earlier being done a bureaucracy works on on these principles and that principle is what has broken down so very often you will hear i mean uh, my, my friends will tell me in private i also have experienced it that formally what would begin as a solid note from a section officer which is not a very it's a group b position at a, a relatively critical but lower level in the system would come up it will be solid and you cannot really fault it for the presentation of facts or anything but today the in the the and a good note in in uh, in a ministry really starts at the director's level minimum very often it starts at the joint secretary's level so what has happened is the lower formations are more and more uh, discarded literally they are allowed to wither on the vine uh, this is one of my experiences having worked in three or four different uh, systems so uh, yes uh, we can recruit them better we need to give them language skills we need to give them analytical skills those are the things which have to be tested in great depth when we are taking a man when we are recruiting a man we are recruiting him for a minimum of 35 to 40 years some of these people come in at the age of in the in in the lower formations of bureaucracy they come in as young as 19 and 20 now they are going to have a huge long career ahead of them what, what are we going to do with them we are going to play literally millions of rupees to, to for them in compensation and salaries etc but uh, we aren't equipping them enough this is actually what i mentioned in my talk was this extraordinary blind side the bureaucracy top bureaucracy has to its lower formations it trains it doesn't it trains its people so inadequately that they don't they are they are they are a difficulty to deal with when you go to meet them in in offices and establishments of the government apart from the aspect of corruption that's a different aspect but this basic ability to do a job well as soon as you go you get your information right the average has to be very good Thank you, Uday. Uh, for the want of time, we'll have to wrap up the session now. Uh, there's one hand raised. Maybe uh, Dr. B. G. Prasad can have the discussion personally with you over yeah. email. Uh, thank you, Uday, for this insightful lecture and this very engaging discussion. And uh, yeah, as I said in before, like we always uh, look at government from the outside, but what goes inside only an insider can tell us. Thank you for this, Uday. Thank you for this account, and we hope to have you again very soon. Thank you very much, Bitasta. So nice of you, and so nice of IAC to call me. But anyway, I have given some frank views, and I hope uh, it has. Said I haven't trodden on many peers, uh, many toes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.